Well, hello. Thank you uh, for staying for my talk. Uh, my name is Miles Folsom. This is a Matonic acrostic, and Satan's incarnation is Thoth. So, just a bit of a introduction. Uh, so, my pursuit of John Milton and his epic poem Paradise Lost began probably about four years ago at the Moreau College Initiative. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that is Holy Cross's college and prison program offered at the Westfield Correctional Facility. So I was a prisoner there when the college program was offered. I got into it. I earned my associate's degree there. Uh, while there, I was taught by a Notre Dame professor named Steve Fallon, uh, who works over at Notre Dame. So the class was English 327, Shakespeare and Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, so within that class, he spoke about a, an acrostic that was discovered by another scholar. Uh, and just to remind you what an acrostic is, an acrostic is a word spelled from the first letter of each line. So he pointed one of these out to us. Uh, and as soon as he did, I immediately became cognizant that this was a possibility that I could discover within the text. So I got kind of excited. Uh, so the first acrostic that I discovered was actually in that class. Probably 30 minutes later, he continued reading, and I pointed it out. So from there, uh, I went back to my cell house, if you will, uh, sat down with Paradise Lost and a Ruler, and 38 lines in, found uh, the one that this presentation uh, surrounds itself around, Thoth. Now, just an overview. Uh, so an acrostic, as I said once again, just to recap, is the first is a word made from the first letter of each line. Uh, I'll discuss, did Milton use acrostics? Was he capable of using acrostics? These are all questions that people are asking now around this debate. Uh, and then were they intentional? So even if you say, you know, maybe he used them, but you gotta ask, or rather, if you say they are there, you gotta ask yourself, were they intentional? Did he do it? Is this something that uh, he thought was clever? Uh, then I will show you a case study. So when asking was it intentional, there is one acrostic in particular that has a greater significance to the argument than most because it is 12 letters long. Uh, and so the size and complexity of this acrostic more than any other argues for its intentional implementation. Once the acrostics have been addressed and I've uh, hopefully led you down this path uh, of confidence, then I'm going to get to the Thoth acrostic. And then we're going to talk about, you know, what does it really mean? Why is it there? Why might John Milton have used it? Now, again, this is the question we have to answer. Did John Milton use acrostics in Paradise Lost? Now we approach this in two prongs. The first prong asks, was Milton capable of using acrostics? Now the reason I start with this is because I'm trying to publish a paper previously in the Milton Quarterly, and I got past the editor and then it went to a review panel uh, by three scholars anonymously. Well, one of the scholars answered back that he did not believe my argument because he did not believe that John Milton was capable of implanting acrostics because he was blind. Uh, John Milton, at the end of his life, went blind. He wrote the entire poem, Paradise Lost, while blind. Uh, his blindness, they say, would add to the difficulty of the task. Uh, in general, but also, they say, that seeing the character of the writer, John Milton, uh, knowing his character, they do not think that he would have implanted them because he couldn't verify himself with his eyes that they were there. Uh, and that probably, they say, would have buffered him from using them. Now, what's the truth? Uh, the truth is John Milton was a genius. John Milton knew uh, you know, almost nine languages, some say 12, and while blind, he wrote what is arguably the greatest epic poem in existence, while blind. Uh, more than that, every morning John Milton woke up called his amanuensis into his room. Maybe that was his wife, maybe that was his friend. And on certain occasions, he's recorded as having dictated at least 30 lines of verse to his amanuensis every morning. 
So here's a man in the darkness of his own head, laying in bed at night, who could create 30 lines of verse. And mind you, this is iambic pentameter. Everything is written in meter. Everything has a cadence. 30 lines. It seems unimpressive that he could make five lines surrounding an acrostic of uh, meager means when he could remember the exact structure of 30 in his head every night at will. That's the type of man we're talking about. Will we ever know if Miltonic acrostics were intentional? We won't. Uh, there is no way that I could ever argue positively that they were intentional. The most that I could do is present you with the evidence, uh, weigh the facts, and hopefully come to the best conclusion. Uh, and that's what I've set out here to do. So this is the case study. This is actually the very first acrostic that I ever found in Paradise Lost. And I found it during that class with Steve Fallon. And at first, I didn't recognize what it was. So here is a scene from Book 10 in the Garden of Eden, when Eve is eaten from the fruit, and she has returned back to Adam, and she is trying to convince him to fall with her. And so as she pleads with Adam to fall with him, the acrostic appears, A-A-T-T-O-M, A-A-T-T-O-M. Now at first, knowing what we do about acrostics and their transformation, uh, you might be inclined to just say, oh, that's nonsense. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a bunch of doubles, whatever. Uh, and in some sense, I would agree with you had we just had one, and it was A-A-T-T-O-M. But the thing about chaos is as soon as chaos is replicated, it's no longer chaos. It is a pattern. You pull order from disorder. So as soon as that formation is repeated immediately after, it signals to me intention. Uh, they double. And not only do the words or the formations double, certain letters within them also double the same. Uh, this is a level of complexity that when it comes to regarding chance occurrence, uh, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't jive. Uh, to me, it's just unbelievable. Uh, so at first, when I found this, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't have an argument. So I said, you know what? That's crazy. It's uncanny. I don't know what it means. I'm not going to let it go. Well, what I realized is this line here, 924, if taken as an instruction, helps you understand that this acrostic needs synthesis. And so what Eve is asking here is between us two, let there be peace, both joining. So the two of them have been separated now by sin. Uh, Eve has separated herself from Adam because she was fooled by the serpent and ate of the fruit. So what she's asking here is that they come back together by joining. So if you take that as instruction and you begin to par down the doubles and join everything that's doubled, the first state you get to is two atoms. If you join the A's and you join the T's, you get Adam and Adam. Now Adam is familiar uh, as an English word, but it does come from the Greek. And in the Greek it means atomist, or rather in the Greek it is atomist, and it means undivided. Uh, and so what Eve is asking here is for them to return back into indivisibility. But you, have, you must check yourself, because what she's asking is actually a sin. Uh, so Milton makes clear in his work and in the poem that a person is not indivisible with his or her spouse. Uh, Milton would have known this, having lost three of his wives, uh, that we are only indivisible with God himself. Uh, and so, in this plea, uh, she, Eve rather, recognizes this and says, you know, that she sinned against God and thee, but he only sins once against God. Uh, and so it's this idea that if he agrees with her, and joins into indivisibility, he betrays his covenant with God. And if you read the context and the passage, everything is pointing, or pushing rather, him to remain with God, to resist her temptation, to put it off, so that he may receive another Eve, is how Milton terms it. Uh, so again, the notable features about this acrostic uh, that make it significant, 12 letters long. Uh, to say that this appeared by chance 
would be similar to saying that if you open up any random book, you're going to find the word abbreviation. Abbreviation is 12 letters long. Now, I understand maybe this isn't a word like abbreviation, but you see the order and you see the formation. So formation to formation, they are equivalent. Uh, but let's push it a little further. Discovering this acrostic is like opening up any random book, finding the word abbreviation, and then noticing that it abuts a context that talks about abbreviation. Because not only does the acrostic appear, but it also seems to suggest some relation to the passage that it abuts. Uh, so you have two senses of discovery here that you wouldn't have with a normal random acrostic you find in any given book. And in fact, this is the methodology that scholars have used, all scholars, to argue for the intentionality of an acrostic. They find one, and then if it matches to the context, they create an argument. That's the methodology. Okay, addressing the desire. So certainly Milton was capable, uh, being a genius. A 12-letter acrostic that matches thematically the passage in a butts is very compelling to me. Uh, but then I ask, okay, why would he have done it? What desire did Milton have to play around with ciphers? You know, I mean, some people think that, you know, they're, they're childish, they're little codes. He was a genius. The guy knew nine languages at least. You're telling me, you know, you wanted to like put hidden codes in his book? That's ridiculous. Uh, so let me, let me talk about some reasons why he might have done this and see if we could change that. Uh, so first one, Jane Partner argued that the Satan acrostic, which was discovered in 1977 <coughs> that Milton uh, is argued to have used, was comparable to the Mars acrostic found within Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, so within the epic poem of the Aeneid, there is an acrostic, and it is Mars. Uh, and so Jane Partner, a Milton scholar, argued that potentially Milton replicated this feat uh, so as to create a new epic convention. So as an epic writer, there are things you have to check off, check boxes, uh, things you have to do to write an epic poem. Well. She suggests that potentially he's seen that Virgil used an acrostic and then used his own to make his own epic convention. So that now he is the source of the epic convention of acrostics. Uh, similarly, Hellenistic practice of philosophy, or rather, uh, apologies, prophecy. Uh, so during the Hellenistic era, acrostics were extremely common, uh, and not just in any writing, they were common in prophecies and religious texts. And this is because priests back in that time period thought that when an oracle gave a prophecy, that within the margin of that prophecy would be an acrostic. They sought out prophecies with acrostics in them because it was argued that was the only verification that it came from a Holy Spirit. Uh, that when the Holy Spirit sent down this message into the oracle, and the oracle uh, announced it aloud, and the priest wrote it down. The acrostic was there as he wrote it. Uh, and they said that was verification of the texts. So when texts were lost or burned, the priests went out searching for these prophecies, particularly looking for the ones with acrostics, because they knew those were authentic. The Hebrew Old Testament has at least two acrostics in it. Uh, this is well known, well established. If you go back to the Hebrew version, Psalms 25 and 34 are written with what are called alphabetical acrostics. Now what an alphabetical acrostic is, rather than it being a word, the first line starts with an A, the second line starts with a B, C, D. Uh, now, for the Psalms, it's the Hebrew alphabet that it follows. Uh, this is an early type of mnemonic device and they say that they would implant them because it would help you, uh, as a practitioner, remember the verse. If you remember that it went by the alphabet, or if you remember the word uh, that it abutted. Also, acrostics, not unfamiliar to the early church fathers. Uh, if you've read St. Augustine, the City of God, he talks about uh, the Sibylline oracles and their acrostics. He says that his source was Cicero. So if you go to Cicero uh, on divinations, and you look to what he said, he goes a bit further. Uh, and what he says is that acrostic use 
is a superior feat, and it is a note to take recognition of, because when an author uses it, uh, it is a mark of their superiority. Uh, so this is a badge of honor across its use. It is also a spiritual symbol of authenticity. St. Augustine talks about a particular acrostic, which is ichthys. Uh, some of you may have heard this. Uh, it translates as fish. Uh, Jesus is the symbol of a fish because it was argued that he moved through our universe just like a fish does water, unfazed by the material sin that is, was around him. Uh, well, what you might not have known is ichthys, the acrostic, actually comes from a pagan prophecy. Uh, it comes from the Sibylline Oracles. And the reason St. Augustine was citing it was because there was an idea that the Holy Spirit was so strong in the world that when it came time for the reemergence of Christ, that it pushed itself through and out of true believers into the pagan world. It was so strong that even the pagan oracles uh, received pieces of it. And that's why we received ichthys in a pagan prophecy. Now, ichthys is an abbreviation which stands for Weos Christos Deos, oh no, I'm sorry, Yeos Christos Deos Weos Soter, which means uh, Jesus Christ, Son of God. So that was the acrostic that they said was next to the prophecy for Jesus Christ. It is an proleptic acrostic in that it looks forward. It suggests the coming of something. That, that is what a prolepse means. Uh, Lactantius, as well, if you're interested, wrote all about sibylline oracles, was a bit obsessed with them. Uh, as noted by St. Augustine as well. So quite popular uh, topic. So then, uh, acrostics out of the way, who is Thoth? Well, that's going to depend on where you are and what time you ask. So Thoth is a memorized figure. Uh, he's also called or known through uh, synecticism. Uh, so in Egypt, Thoth arrived roughly 6,000 BCE is the record. Uh, so mind you, this was 8,000 years ago that the record of, of this god arrives in Egypt. Uh, now as Egypt falls and Greece begins to rise, they adopt the same god system, but they change the name. And so Thoth is known to have moved to Greece and was known as Hermes. Uh, now the earliest mention of Hermes is 1400 BCE, which is far before the Greeks as we know them. Uh, just to you know, assert the fact that he existed before Greece moved in. Uh, now the same happened in Rome, about 400 BCE is when Rome adopted the god system of Greece and took on uh, the framework but changing the names. And so Hermes then moved to Rome as Mercury. Uh, and at about 2 BCE, as the Germanic tribes were coming together and again forming a government, they adopted the god system from Rome, changing the names. And Mercury went to Germany as Odin. Uh, so what you see here is a single personage's personage or symbol traveling throughout the world over, uh, you know, roughly six thousand years. Uh, Thoth, Hermes, Mercury, Odin is the evil with evil everywhere at all times in the world. He is a symbol for empire. He is at the top of it. Uh, and mind you, the characteristics that Thoth possesses. Uh, according to history, according to the Egyptians, is that he was the creator of the universe. He is the creator of knowledge. He is the creator of the alphabet. He is the creator of religion, mathematics, astronomy, astrology. Uh, they give this man, person, whoever, sort of the source of all on earth. Uh, so Satan and Thoth both claim to be self-begotten. Uh, which is in tune with their idea of being a godhead. They claim to be godheads, Satan and Thoth. Uh, they are both record keepers. Uh, they are both father of the arts. Uh, Satan, according to Milton, fathers the arts. He fathers music when he builds pandemonia. He fathers sport uh, in the warring with uh, God, father and the son. They are both inventors of religion. Uh, Satan, when he rebels against heaven and is kicked out onto earth, creates paganism. Well, similarly, as I said a moment ago, Thoth is attributed with being the creator of religion in the world. Uh, and if you look at the line of religion that he, he is given, it is the pagan line. Uh, so very similarly, both are inventors of the pagan religion. 
They are both inventors of astrology and astronomy. Milton makes this clear when he depicts uh, Satan within Paradise Lost, looking up at the stars and pulling out the constellations. They are both masters of speech, master rhetoricians. Uh, Satan within Paradise Lost, on numerous occasions, is compared to Egypt or something Egyptian. Uh, he's compared to the Pharaoh pursuing the Hebrews out of Egypt. He's compared to the locusts of Egypt. Uh, he's called an Egyptian dragon. He is said to be Typhon. Typhon is the Egyptian dragon of the netherworld from the Egyptian orthodoxy. He is compared to pyramids said to be sitting atop of one, also said to be rising from a pyramidal flame. Now, summation. Uh, so the importance of acrostics grows. Uh, previous acrostics didn't really change the interpretation of Paradise Lost much. They offered, you know, minor uh, exponential roles. Well, Thoth changes the interpretation. And this is why I'm so passionate about arguing for the intention of acrostics. Because Thoth is the hidden counterplot. He is the grand epic anti-hero of this poem. And his identity had been hidden in an acrostic for roughly 300 years. Scholars have often argued that Miller's characters were imbalanced. The son becomes Jesus Christ. Now, Milton never calls the son Jesus Christ. He calls him the son. But in your mind, you make a connection when you read the son. And so immediately the character is contextualized with a wealth of history and information that you have in your head. So now, when he says the son, you think Jesus Christ. And you think of all the attributes and all the information you've ever accumulated around it. Well, they said that it was unremarkable that Satan didn't have a similar backstory, and it left the characters imbalanced. Well, scholars reconciled this by saying that, well, it's the problem of evil. You can't name evil. The problem with naming evil and saying, like, that chair is evil is that no one else looks anywhere else for evil. If I say the chair is evil, well, then that's the only evil. And if we destroy it, you know, God save us all. We're, you know, we're healed. So they said he wouldn't never attach Satan to an identity. But the thing about Thoth, uh, if you remember the timeline, is that he doesn't die. He moves throughout the world, transmuting from one identity to the next over a 6,000-year period spanning at least four civilizations. And for that reason, he is the greatest epic anti-hero in all of literature. And he was hidden for 300 years, only discovered by chance. Uh, and then before I conclude, uh, so bonus track. I plan to do this on my iPad so I can write, so you're going to have to bear with me here. Uh, so what we have here are the first 45 lines of Paradise Lost. This is book one. Uh, this is the acrostic Thoth. Here you have the narrator asking, who was it who perverted the mother of mankind? And next to that question, almost as if an answer, appears the acrostic Thoth. Now, another scholar had pointed out that next to these letters, O-T-H, the second letter spells foe. And so I just sort of packed that away and said, oh, that was interesting. Well, let me tell you, the other day when I was making this slide, I realized something greater here. And what I had realized before, after seeing the foe, was that if you look at these two letters, this could say head. And so I knew to myself, like, okay, Thoth is here, Foe is here, Head could be here. Still didn't think anything of it, you know, at this point I'm kind of into mysticism, so I pack it away. Well, what I realized the other day is that after Thoth comes an I, and then after that comes A-R-W, and after that comes H-W-T-I. And so if you look at, look at them as if they were anagrams, the I stays the same. The ARW turns to war, W-A-R, and the H-W-T-I turns to with. Uh, and so what it says is, I 
war with the head foe Thoth. I war with the head foe Thoth. The father of the pagan religion, father of empires throughout all time. I believe that John Milton hid this acrostic in there so that it would always be remembered and that we would never forget uh, what evil might look like in the world. Thank you. that you found in Milton, or even generally with the acrostics, do you, do you find that they always um, are part of, part of the context in which they are, you know, included in the paragraphs, or are there ever just, you know, random acrostics that don't have any connection with them? Yeah, sure. Uh, content? So there are certainly random acrostics. Generally, they're small. Cat, hat, fat, dog, so on and so forth. They have no relation to the context. Uh, that's not to say that they're not intentional, but the smaller an acrostic is, the harder it is to argue that it was intentionally implanted. Because someone will just say, hey, three letters, man, I can find a cat in any book. And that would be true. Uh, so the larger acrostic, the better chances you are for arguing for intentionality. Uh, there are smaller ones who I have uh, separately argued that were intentional, uh, but I had to develop a new methodology to approach it. Uh, those weren't included in this paper, and that's still forthcoming. Also, another question. I feel like the deal with well, with the acrostics, they have to be you know exactly lined up the way I guess it was first written, right? But like when, when it's in different publishing editions, things like that, couldn't acrostics kind of get lost in in what maybe certain lines are longer than than they than, than they were when it originally written? I mean, maybe it's different because it's kind of an epic poem. Yeah, no. so the structure is very uniform throughout any. Right. So, if it's reproduced in the original language, uh, and it's written in verse, the acrostics will always be there. Editors do change things. Uh, they're not too quick to change letters, but they will change capitalizations, which has affected my interpretation of acrostics before, and my current work on the side. Uh, I had to go back to the original work where G was capitalized, which lent emphasis emphasis to a three-letter word that then matched a three-letter acrostic. Um, so editors definitely, they hack down. They don't mean to. They, they're trying to put their own spin. You know, I mean, they're in a very tight field. Uh, they do hack down on acrostics. If it's translated and the scholar doesn't know every acrostic in the work, you, you lose them all. For instance, I mean, you can pick up Virgil's and Nid right now. You'll never find your Mars acrostic because it's in the original Latin. Uh, you would have to know. And then that translator would have to care enough about it to uh, adapt his translation around the acrostic. All right, thank you.